nation's favourite antiques experts. That's me. I like that. Behind the wheel of a classic car. Hold on. <laughs> and a goal to scar Britain for antiques. <laughs> on guard. The aim to make the biggest profit at auction. But it's no mean feat. I can't believe it. There'll be worthy winners <laughs> yes. and valiant losers. Okay, I was robbed. Will it be the high road to glory? Right, come on, let's go. Or the slow road to disaster? Oh, road. Ah! Oh, road. This is the Antiques Road Trip. <laughs> Top dollar. Yup, we're in North Yorkshire on a spanking new adventure. This is the life, isn't it? We're driving around in a gorgeous car with, you know, quite good company. Oh, thanks and, very much. Um, <laughs> What's not to love? It's new BFFs. Dealer, Stephen Moore, and auctioneer, Natasha raskin Sharp. Glasgow gal Natasha is an authority in the world of art, but adores anything of beauty. This is seriously exquisite stuff. Geordie Stephen Moore is simply potty for ceramics. I love my pottery, and that is a smashing one. I had heard that you have the world's nicest accent. What and now think? I can hear oh, for myself. Are you kidding? It's Have not, you heard yourself? It's not bad for a Geordie, is oh. it? Not bad at all. And just take a look at this beauty, a 1964 Rolls-Royce Silver Cloud, manufactured before a time that seat belts were mandatory. And a car such as this requires the appropriate attire. The gloves are so on point. I am loving those. Well, I can accessorise once I can <laughs> drive the car. <laughs> You know what you're doing, though, right? Of course I know what I'm doing. Crumbs. Ah. This pair have £200 each to start them off on their endeavour to make huge profits. Uh, I think <laughs> if it's something gorgeous, I might put a lot of money into it. Oh, really? But, um, you can be tempted. I can be tempted. Have you been known to be tempted? It depends what you're talking about. <laughs> Rascals. The fancy roller will go forth from North Yorkshire wind their way north, taking a tour of Scotland before concluding in Perth. This is an exciting time. And we haven't fallen out yet, so that's a good oh, sign. Right. <laughs> exactly. Today, our road trip companions will be selling at a sale room in Newcastle. But let the fanfare begin in the village of thornton le -Dale. So we're in a posh car. We sound like we're in a posh place. Thornton Lee something. Thornton Le Dale. Thornton Le Dale. Why well, have one name when you can have three? The conversation flows like fine wine, doesn't it? I was just thinking, very chocolate boxy here. And that's because this actual cottage has appeared on countless chocolate boxes and calendars over the years. Fancy. <laughs> Selby's Antiques and Fine Art is housed within an 18th century stable block. And before we're even out of the car, this pair are ready to go. Right, come on, Stephen. Hang on. Our first <laughs> port of call. Come uh, on. Ladies first, Get clearly. In here. They're like a couple of pooches let off the lead. There's a vast array of antique and contemporary in here. Plenty of room to mooch about. Exercise. This was literally a seated history. They will have on the bottom, there we are, ER coronation. This was at the Queen's coronation. And if you were, if you were an aristocrat, you've got a stool with a back and a monogram on it. Um, but this, I mean, is the most gorgeous velvet. But 325 pounds, that's too rich for me. Nice thing though. Now, where's Natasha in this cavernous establishment? The whole idea of the piggy bank, you don't quite know exactly how much is in there, but you know when you open it up and release the funds, it's much more than you were expecting. A glass one, albeit a home guard, Scandinavian, trendy, kind of um, knobbly glass one, kind of defeats the purpose, because you can almost see exactly how much is in there, and where is the fun in that? With you all the way, Natasha. Now, under the exacting eye of Stephen, Oh, this isn't really my sort of thing, but it's a photographic enlarger. It's turn of the century, 1900, 1910. And I suppose what you must do, this is long before the iPhone, 
other brands are available. Put your small glass plate in there. Put your big plate in there. And then there's a little pinhole in there. So I suppose you must lift this up, expose the big plate and voila, what we can do in seconds on a phone, you've done on a glass plate. In the late 19th century, the Victorians loved an idealised portrait of themselves, a bit like today's selfies, and thus the enlarger was created to provide a bigger and better image. 30 quid? That's quite cheap, I think. I think that's one for the pile. Anything else? Ooh, no. These could be exciting. Antique handcuffs. Hours and hours of fun. And the thing is, I could slip Natasha's wrist into this, leave her here, get off in the car, and I win. It doesn't quite work like that, though, Stephen. Hello, hello. What's going on with Natasha? The thing is with Stephen, he is one of the country's foremost ceramics experts. And so at some point on our trip, it's inevitable, I will buy a piece of ceramic. And how scary that Stephen will be the one to scrutinise. Can you imagine if I bought this? He'd be mortified, I'd be mortified. Yeah, yeah. put it back quick. Oh. oh, hello. What's this? Ah, it's the lavatory, but hang, hang on. Well, I hope nobody's in there. <laughs> 18th century tea bowls. And two saucers. One a bit broken, but these are... 1750, 1760. I should ask how much these are. You find antiques everywhere. Yeah. Flushed with excitement, Stevens found De La Rey. He also wants to know the very best on the photographic enlarger and the 19th century handcuffs. The photographic enlarger, that was marked at 30. What can that be? I can do you that one for 20. OK, right, 20, that's a deal. We, we'll definitely take that. Um, the handcuffs, um, these are priceless. New in. I think straight 50. OK. That's the price so on those. 50 on those. And um, <laughs> I was washing my hands in the lavatory. Not, not in the loo, obviously, but uh, being, yeah. how much would they be? They were just ignored on the ignored top of the lavatory. Ignored on the top. Speculative lot, £30. Could the cuffs be 20 if I pay 50 for the handcuffs? I can do you that. Right. Yeah. That is a deal. That's a deal. That's a great haul. The photo enlarger, the handcuffs, and those tea bowls and saucers, all for £90. Natasha? Uh-huh. 50 quid. Oh, my day. Hours of fun. Anything else? Um, yes, um, uh, some cups, 18th century cups and saucers were in the lavatory. Oh, for goodness yeah, and, sake. And um, like a photographic enlargy thing, which is a bit of a speculative thing, but it's £20, so... And, and, and you've already bought three things? Yeah, of course. I don't mess around. I haven't found anything. Oh, no, seriously. Nothing. Right, leave me to it. I need okay. to get in the zone here. Well, you're putting me off with your... Is that an intimidation tactic, saying you're going to... Oh, yes. ...lock me up? I don't like it. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Off he pops. Now, come on, Natasha. Let's start parting with the cashola. I cannot believe I'm standing in front of a pair of early to mid 20th century polar bear vases, but they are quite ugly. But are they ugly, beautiful, brutti ma buoni, as they say in Italy? I don't know. What they are, two glazed pots, vases, decorated in shallow relief with polar bears on icebergs catching salmon. On everyone's Christmas list, I'm sure. They're priced at 65 for the pair. One is in really nice order when it comes to the glaze. It's not discoloured that much. The other one, although they're a perfect pair, is really discoloured definitely by nicotine. But the fact that this one doesn't have it, they must have been sitting together. So I think I have hope. I think that someone's managed to get rid of the yellow on one and just didn't bother with the other. That's what I'm going with. I thought you said you were trying to impress Stephen. Let's find Ray to see what he can do. £65. Pounds. Is that your best price? The very best price. Um, they can be £40 pounds the pair. £40 pounds the pair. Yeah. They are a bit weird and wonderful. It took me a while to get there, but I think we'll go for the polar bears. £40. Pounds. You know, the more I hold these, I think the more I love them. OK, right, yep. thank you. Okay. Finally, thank a purchase from Natasha. 
Can't wait to see Stephen's face when he parks his peepers on those fellas. Now, speaking of the big handsome devil, and we're not talking about the car. A little bit in love with Sasha. I think there's something about, I'm from Newcastle, she's from Glasgow. There's something about being northern. If I'd left her locked up in those handcuffs, though, I might, I might be well ahead. <laughs> nice horn. With uncontrollable excitement, Stephen is Whitby bound. And he's not here for the fish and chips. Let the shopping shenanigans continue. In here, at Whitby Antiques and Collectibles. Nice. After his blowout this morning, he's got £110 left. It is absolutely chocker in here. Sure to be something right up his boulevard. Surprisingly, a jug. I love my pottery, and that is a smashing one. Royal Dalton, great name, good size. And it's £110. Mm. I hate to tell you, but that's all of your kitty sunshine. Ah, now, this is more like it. We love a bit of needlework. And it's interesting, when I saw this, I thought this was a 17th century needlework box. It's not, it is a needlework box, but it's 20th century, it's probably 1920, 1930. The big clue, we always look inside, look at the bottom. The inside is just too clean, the hinges are wrong. Um, there wouldn't be hinges like this in the 17th century. Um, but really, really good, I love needlework. Marked at 80 pound. I've only got 110 left. Time to find the lady in charge. Marion! I shouldn't be saying I love this, but I do love this. My face would be okay. lying for it. Does this belong to somebody who might be a little bit flexible? They'll probably consider 10%. OK. Do you think she might do 60? She may do. Do you think she might do 50? I could give her a ring. OK. Oh, I do love the call to the dealer bit. Hello, Deborah. It's Marion from Whitby Antiques. I've got a gentleman that's interested in your tapestry box. It's lovely. And he said, would, would you take £50 for it? I'll ask him, would you go a bit higher? Would you do 55? 55? Yes, she would. OK, Deborah. Bye-bye, love. Bye. I don't want it now. <laughs> no, I will take it, thank you. <laughs> I suppose I've got to pay you some money now. OK. 25, 35, 45, 55. So this is yours. Thank you very much. This is mine. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hallelujah! Finally, Stephen's simply fizzy with delight. Meanwhile, Natasha has made her way to a small fishing village on the Yorkshire coast, Robin Hood's Bay. Lovely. Today, it's a popular tourist retreat, but amongst the brooding cliffs and maze of tiny winding streets lies a chequered history rich with the pursuits of smuggling vagabonds. Local archivist Marion Berry explains all. When did the area acquire the name Robin Hood's Bay? And of course, the question is, is that associated to Robin Hood of Nottingham? I mean, there's this story that he ended up at Ravenscar, which is a promontory up there. And he shot an arrow, which came <laughs> all the way over here. And that's where he decided to build a village. But a bit far-fetched, that one. That's some shot with your arrow. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he was very good with Robin Hood, but not quite that good. We may not know how the town got its name, but we do know it had a turbulent history. It was once home to the Saxons, who were raided by the Vikings, who in turn were nearly destroyed by the Normans. As you can see, just looking round, it's not the easiest of bays to sail into. And you think, you know, on a rough sea, it's uh, not easy at all if you misjudge it. Smuggling had exploded across the UK coast in the 18th and 19th centuries due to the punitive taxation imposed by a succession of governments desperate to pay for costly wars in Europe. How many people were on patrol trying to stop all of this smuggling? It varied from one to, in the later days, you know, two or three, and I think there was, there was one captain and six boatmen or something like that, but, but not very many because it wouldn't be just here, it would be other 
uh, places right up and down the coast that they were responsible for. Despite tough punishment, if you were caught, the task force against smuggling was so small, it meant it was a hugely lucrative business. Secret tunnels and hidden alleyways here were perfect for clandestine plunder. Vast quantities of luxury goods, such as brandy, tobacco and even playing cards, would be spirited through the King's Beck Tunnel. So you're a smuggler. You've managed to navigate your way around the rocks here, get your boat up onto the shore, outwit the excise men, but then the next step is getting rid of the goods, the smuggling. So did that take place in here? Out there, in full view of the customs cutters, because they were very brave in those days, uh, uh, then offload onto the cobbles, the smaller boats that would come in here, either by sail or road right up to the way foot if the tide was in, and then the barrels and the bags and the cases of contraband were brought up here. But how did you get rid of your heaving swag bag? In the roof here, we're all under the houses here, and there'll be a nice little trap door there, so you go and knock on the trap door, someone's up there, hears you, and then the hand comes down to collect what it is that you want. And they're along here. There aren't many of them, but there's enough for them to be very useful when you're trying to hide away your contraband. Yeah. Particularly if somebody's chasing you from behind. Yeah. And then you go up there and out the other end, and then you're free and off up into the moors. So slick were the 18th century smuggling operations that it was thought that all 900 villagers were involved in helping the cause. How marvellous. By the 19th century, smuggling was in steep decline due to the creation of the Coast Guard and the free trade policy that slashed import duties. But here in Robin Hood's Bay, the history of the smuggler will never fade. And look at us sitting here like a couple of smugglers with our brandy and our wildly controversial <laughs> playing cards. I mean, someone better stop us soon, right? <laughs> Shall I deal? Oh, yes, absolutely, eh? What a lovely way to end the afternoon in Robin Hood's Bay, some playing cards and brandy. Wait till I tell Stephen, he'll be so jealous. I'll bet. The road trip buddies are reunited after their whirlwind tour of Yorkshire. We're done now, so we're Gan and Yem. Going home? Yes, exactly. Well Gan done. Gan and Yem. Oh, lovely. Oh, yeah. yeah, this is towards your neck of the woods. Gan and Yem, and it's from the Danish for home. Oh, there you are. So we're all Vikings, really. What a font of knowledge, eh? Nighty night. Good morning, Tyne and Weir. The spirit of ecstasy is on the move once more. What are we going to call it? I think it's definitely a she, isn't it? Oh, definitely, definitely, definitely she. she, yeah. Lavinia Lavish. <laughs> the name's Lavish, not Lavish. Life is short, be exactly. more Lavish. Life is short, be more Lavish. It's the only way. Lavinia Lavish. Lavinia Lavish. Love you. Oh, she waved us. <laughs> We've been blessed by a drag queen. Can I get an amen? Amen! Ha! Ah. After that divine moment, we could be in for a run of good luck. Here's hoping because Natasha only spent £40 on her large polar bear vases. Maybe I'm quite excited by the polar bears. Leaving her with £160 for today's shopping. Meanwhile, Stephen's spending like a man who owns a Rolls. <laughs> He's blown 145 smackers on the photographic enlarger, the handcuffs, the tea bowls and the sewing box with maybe older needlework. We love a bit of needlework. Leaving him just £55 for the rest of today's jollities. Any tips? Because you were driving yesterday. I have to say, I'm so impressed the way that you were chatting with me and making jokes because all I can think of is steady. Yeah, don't blame you. Having dropped her compadre elsewhere, Natasha is heading towards the village of Cleedon. In particular, Cleedon Antiques and Gifts. And they also sell flowers. With a wodge of £160, the sky's the limit in here, Natasha. I want to go down in the ground, but I'm scared I'll get my jeans dirty. Hey, I'm sure owner Judy will have vacuumed. Here you have a basket of scarves and a tote bag for sale, and then just creeping up behind them, 
a Victorian toasting fork. Like, <laughs> I do love shops like this. This has, you know, it's a proper piece of history. Cast brass, it's not a terribly exciting piece of metal. You pop on your toast, you pop it into the fire, hence the long handle, your bread is toasted, et voila. It's a lovely thing. Five pounds is actually more than it's worth at auction. It's worth a pound. Well, I think we'd better move on. I'm quite overwhelmed by the sheer quantity of small items. Usually when you go into an antique shop, there are items of every size and shape and you don't know where to start, but everything is miniature in here, so it's equally overwhelming, despite the fact this is a small shop. But I, I feel there's something that stands out on this table. The barristers here, they scream Carlton Ware of Stoke-on-Trent. Listen to that. There are so many ceramics in here. Can you hear that? <laughs> Careful. They are obviously quite tongue-in-cheek, quite facetious. The wee barrister has a bit of a ruddy nose and some ruddy cheeks. He's getting heated in the argument, in the debate. He objects. But I don't think I object to their style. I think that they're quite... I think I say sustained. I think I say, <laughs> go on, Carlton Ware. I quite like these. How old? Not very. Well less than 100 years old. Probably about 60 years old or so. They're mid-20th century. I think she likes them. Judy, these barristers, have you had them long? No. No? <laughs> about a day. <laughs> a day? <laughs> oh, they're so fresh nice. stock. Yes. Oh, how exciting. Oh. The only thing I'm confused about is the price. Uh, £10, or there was one that said £8.50. So, so what are they coming in at? They're £10 each. They're £10 each. Right. £20. Am I scared of that? A wee bit. A wee bit scared. Um, yeah. OK, let's just do it, for goodness sake. If you don't object, Judy, I will leave the money on the table. That's lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks. Frugal is Natasha's middle name today, but interesting find for £20. Meanwhile, Stephen is just a little further north in the seaside town of South Shields. He's taking to the water for a journey back in time to learn how stricken seafarers' lives were saved in the first lifeboats. This fully restored craft is a century old. It was launched 28 times, and she saved eight souls over her working life. Historian Stephen Landles explains more. She's a 40-foot self-writing mortar lifeboat and is one of the earliest examples of an RNLI mortar lifeboat. And why is preserving these boats important? Well, the Maritime Trust retains this traditional board building skills which built these boats. But more importantly, this, this boat and the other boats in the Maritime Trust form part of the areas and the river's rich maritime heritage. A heritage that can be traced back to the first ever lifeboat all due to a disaster in the 18th century. In March 1789, the Collier Brig adventure came ashore and the people on the shore were helpless and couldn't have a boat to go out and rescue them. Tragically, eight of the 13 crew perished. The town took action by launching a competition for a groundbreaking design with a substantial prize of two guineas for the winner. Rich shipbuilder Henry Greathead and lowly parish clerk William Woodhave rose to the challenge. Willie Woodhave had proposed a self-writing lifeboat and Greathead, with his flat-bottom boat, which was akin to a Royal Navy troop carrier, that didn't find favour with the committee. And the committee also thought that Woodhave's self-writing boat was too radical. With no outright winner, the committee combined their own maritime experience with both designs and created what would become known as the original. The wealthy great head was chosen to build it. During the first 10 years, it rescued over 200 people from distress. The original never lost uh, any member of its crew. The original and the best. The Northeast Maritime Trust is devoted to restoring the very ships that were built to make the North East Seas that bit safer. What do we have here? 
Well, this is the last lifeboat built for the Tyne Lifeboat Institution. It's called the Bedford. It was built in 1886. How many years did the Bedford Sea service? The Bedford served for about 50 years, launched 50 times and saved uh, 55 lives over its career. But as the lifeboats developed by the RNLI, mm. they introduced the first experimental motor lifeboat at Tynemouth, just over the river from here. And overnight, that made the old rowing lifeboats obsolete. In the mid-19th century, a new, improved lifeboat would echo the same elements as the penniless Willie Woodhave's 1789 design. Woodhave designed the first self-writing lifeboat as a concept, but the actual first operational self-writing lifeboat was developed by James Beeching and the RNLI. Beeching's design was adopted nationally by the RNLI, but the Tyne Lifeboat Society fiercely kept their faith in lifeboats like the Bedford. So she needs a bit of tender loving care? It certainly does. And if we go into the workshop, we'll show you uh, corking and some of the restoration techniques which the, the Trust's team of volunteers actually use. Great, lead on. Corking is filling in the seams that would otherwise let the water in. Volunteer Paul has got a new first mate. Hello. So it's just a case of uh, folding the, the cotton up like that, pushing it up, and, and it sticks out. You can see there. It's, yeah. it's, it's proud. Push it in till it's sitting well below the uh, well below the level. Till it temple. almost disappears. Okay, so can I have a go? Yes, you certainly can. You seem to like kind of gather a bit and shove it in. Oh! <laughs> Well, it's all right, you're getting that. Yeah, OK. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. And then sort Loop of it push. Up. Oops. And if you go back along and, uh, and, and knock it all in. Uh, very well done. I mean, that's too bad, is it? We'd like a job. Well, the antiques don't work out. <laughs> yes, maybe. <laughs> Thanks to the dedication of the North East Maritime Trust, the birth of emergency services right here on the River Tyne will never be forgotten. Meanwhile, before we embark on shopping, a spot of manoeuvring beckons. There's nothing quite like when you're driving a Rolls Royce and you think you've put it in reverse and you've actually put it in first gear and it's automatic and it just lurches towards a dry stone wall. There is actually, I can confirm, nothing quite like that. Hello, thank you so much. We did it. Wow, a three-point turn and just over two tons of automobile. Respect, eh? Natasha's making her way to the village of Corbridge in Northumberland. And it was right here that the doyenne of romantic novels, Catherine Cookson, lived. For the Rolls Royce, it doesn't matter who's driving it, how many points there are in your turn. People will stop. They will allow it because they just want to eye up Lavinia Lavish, my new best friend. She's a beauty. Corbridge Antique Centre is Natasha's last chance to scoop up some goodies. Tempus Fugit, Natasha, you've only got two items. With a bountiful £145 remaining, you need to get a wiggle on. With over 40 dealers selling in here, what will catch Natasha's eye? These are as light as air, it's silly, but they are 18th century silver and they have such a lovely pattern here on the handle, very sweet, almost looks like stitching that uh, terminates in a nice little sprig at the top. They're very sweet, but I just don't think they're heavy enough and I feel sad turning away from 18th century silver. And it's Newcastle silver as well, maybe it's worth a punt, I don't know. It's definitely a maybe, that's definitely a maybe. They're really sweet. And just to spice things up, Stephen's also shopping in here. Look out. Unlike his companion, Stephen is spending like no tomorrow. £55 is his sum and total to spend. I think Lavinia Lavish likes a baby shan, don't you? I prefer champagne myself. <laughs> what delights will entice you in here, then? Well, this is only £10. Yeah, it's a bit broken. It's got damage all the way around the top. And, yep, there's a bit missing there. As I always check the bits which are prominent. 
it is, Canton Chinese, it's about 1840, 1850. And what I'm thinking is I bought those cups and saucers out of the lavatory the other day. They were £20, that's £10, that would make a £30 lot. And this would just add a little bit more meat to the pudding, maybe tempt a better price. I think a £10, there's no question about that's coming home with me. He's a fast worker. Oh, hello down there. <laughs> hello, ducky, as they say. You're a vision. You just appeared above me like a vision, yes. Romeo and Juliet. Or is it, is, it, is it Rapunzel? I should be letting my hair down. There's not much of it left, but never mind. Well, that would be handy because I do need a bit of a lifeline, to be honest no, with you. Oh, I'd be glad that you get back out in that case because I'm almost done. Enough of this fairy tale malarkey. What else can tempt Natasha? Made in Denmark. I confess, I do like something with that kind of mid century font and that kind of watchword, Denmark. I love mid century Scandinavian design. It's a mirror. A dressing mirror, how cool is that? £30 is a great price. I think there's a profit in that. This is in the style of Danish designer Kai Christiansen, who was hugely influential in creating what would become known as the Danish modern style. And I've actually just seen this. How much is this? But the thing about broken stuff, this is £25. It says to restore. It does, I mean... His foot's been off, her foot's been off, it's got a chip, her head's been off, but it's a really good 1920s, yeah, Austrian Vienna figure, signed by the artist. You know what, 25 pound. At least they've got their arms. <laughs> Let's find dealer Alison. So is this a, another kind of 10% kind of dealer? It is, yeah. So it can't be 20? It would be 22. OK, right, I'm not going to argue, 22. Thank and I'll you. take, you know, that little um, Chinese yeah, thing yeah. for £10. Oh, so that's 32. Yep. Definitely not 30. Definitely 32. Well, God you. loves to try her, so <laughs> 10, 20. There we are, 32. That's Thank yours, you. and this is mine. I'm off now. Take care. £10, then, for the damaged Canton enamel vase, and 22 for the also damaged porcelain seated couple. As Stephen gets the car warm for Natasha, She's ready to get the very best from Alison. I'm going quite disparate here. Uh, centuries between these items, 18th century for the spoons, but Newcastle, nice provincial ones. And then Denmark, mid 20th century. I am in love. Are you into this style? Not really, to be not honest. Really. I like the older stuff, yeah. OK, I hope you're not attending the auction. Right, anyway. <laughs> so I think it would be nice to take these, which are £28, and the mirror, which is marked up at £30 to the auction. So 58 in total. May I ask kindly for your best price? Um, 27 on the mirror and 25 on the spoons. 27 and 25, so we land at 52? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, oh, my maths is so bad. 52 is spot on. There's a coopered barrel over there, which... I just feel would look great in someone's garden. What's your best price on the barrel? The barrel, uh, 45. 45 for the barrel. That is 97 pounds. Yes. I think for three items, totally different for less than 100. Let's do it, Alison. That's okay, cool. Great. Thank you. Good. The barrel, I'll come back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alison. I appreciate that. Thank you. Take Thanks. Care, Bye. Thanks. With the shopping all done and dusted, the big stylish wheels are on the move again. So tell me something weird that I would have for dinner here. They say that the locals here eat shipes head and spice cake. Shipes? Shipes head, head and spice cake. I'd stick to fish and chips, eh? Shut eye beckons. The Geordie Jamboree continues. We began in Thornton Le Dale, moseyed around North Yorkshire, zipped around South Tyneside and Northumberland before heading east for Newcastle. Newcastle Castle is not only the birthplace of Newcastle, <laughs> but this Norman fortress is the perfect spot for some online auction viewing. I promised you a view. <laughs> this is incredible. Welcome to my home. Oh, yes, indeed. Wow, we. I promise you a castle in here, I've got you one. I just am amazed. Well, I suppose we'd better get down to business, shall we? 
go to the Great Hall. I'm scared. It's not about winning. I'm just scared about I'm losing putting, money. I'm putting a brave face on. A brave face. But come on, to the Great Hall, my lady. To the Great Hall. Follow me. Okay, I will follow you. This is your patch. Their purchases will go under the hammer at the city's Thomas N. Miller auctioneers. All presided over by the guy in charge, Guy Maxson. I wonder what he will make of Natasha's £157 haul of five lots. Do spill. The silver spoons, I think these were a good buy. These were a tactical decision, let's say, being of local interest. They don't have huge wow factor. It would be nice of being a big set of spoons or perhaps a big basting spoon. But Newcastle silver's widely collected, so these should do well today, I think. Stephen was just a few pounds from splurging every penny. He spent £177 on five lots. Any preference, Guy? The needlework box, I think, will sell well today. It's in good condition, it's attractive, it's had a lot of interest on the viewing. It's not particularly old, but nevertheless, it's got a good look to it, and that'll appeal to people today. Excellent news. Rather fittingly, our road trip royalty will spectate the online auction showdown from the castle's grand hall. Should we get started or should we just run away? I think we should get started. Should we face the music? There's no running away. Here it goes. First up, it's Natasha's rather large polar bear vases. 20 bid, 25, 30 bid. At £30 bidder here next to me. Are you bidding, sir? Yes, you are. 35, I've got you. 35, 40 bid against you. 40 here, 45 in the room. Yay! <laughs> 45 pounds, back of the room at 45. Thinking internet at 45 pounds. Oh. This is your final, <laughs> final call. Sold and in profit. Nice start for a speculative buy. Ah, oh, nothing to write home about, but a little bit of relief. The 19th century handcuffs from Stephen is his debut lot today. 30 bed, 35, 40 oh. bed. Internet, Push on, 40 pounds offered. Any advance at 40. This is your last chance. At forty pounds, final call, internet. Going forty, all Dan. Forty pounds. I know. It's only a wee loss. Ten pound down. Let's be having you, Stephen. Cold water and porridge for that lot. I thought they were authentic items, and mm. they were genuine, and they were in good condition, and they were by the best maker. OK, I was robbed. Maybe justice can prevail with Natasha's Carlton Ware legal eagle napkin rings. 20, 30, 40, 5. 45 accepted on the net. Any advance of 45, 50, yes, we get there. <laughs> <laughs> Are you serious? Well, that's 55, yes, thought so. 55 bid. Oh, 55 is bid. 60 against you, sir. 65, you'll never see another. I've got 65, I've got 70 bid. I am 75, back for more. Seriously? I've got 80 pounds, you're all out. 80 pounds selling on the net. We're done? Oh. I think you should be on the throne, not me. What a whopper of a profit, Natasha. Do you know something that did me proud? Stephen's early 20th century photographic enlarger is next up for grabs. And I've got six pounds offered. That's a bit mean. Any further interest? Waiting on the internet? Eight bid? Don't wait. I've got eight pounds offered. Any bidding at ten? If not at eight, we're going to sell it at eight pounds. Can I just say eight sounds so much nicer than six? <laughs> Ouch! Clearly, this isn't a fave of the Newcastle bidders. I'm going to predict you'll never buy one of those again. Um, no. <laughs> Next up are the provincial Georgian silver spoons from Natasha. Remember there for 35, 40, but I've got 45 and you're all out. Thank you, Newcastle. The net's got it here at 45 pounds. I've got 50 bid on the net. Push on internet shortly. Any advance at 50? All quiet in the room. I've got 50 pounds. The bid's on the net. Final chance. Come on, yeah! They double the money. Doubled up again. You are on a roll, Natasha. I, I thought there was a tinier profit in that. Oh, I'm excited. Now, can the tides turn with the combo lot of damaged porcelain? 20 bid, 25. Oh, push on short in that. Go on. 25 off it. Come on, internet. 25 here. All sure. All out in the room. I've got 25 on the screen. This is your last call. It's got to go. It's all away. 25 and finished. A modest loss. A modest loss. <laughs> Another modest loss. 
Oh, blimey. There's still time to make a comeback, Stephen. Survived almost 300 years, ended up in a loo. I've rescued them. And yeah. somebody has got a little treasure for £25. Yeah. So my job is done. Yeah. One way of looking at it, the on-trend Danish dressing table mirror from Natasha is next. What dare I say for £50 for this? 35 45 Oh, is that real? Oh, is he... Oh, he has that. We're up to 45 on the net. Are we done in the room? At 45, selling to the internet bidder here at 45, all finished. Oh, yeah. High five, Henny. The auction gods are shining on you today, Natasha. I love mid-century items, and they so rarely make a profit when I buy them. That's really exciting. <laughs> Next, we have Stephen's porcelain-seated couple. Should be harmless. Ah. Interest bidding overseas at 25. Oh, overseas. Do we have 30? Any advance 25? The bids on the internet here. At 25 pounds. Further interest, surely. Come along, internet. At 25 pounds, I think we're done. All sure. Selling on the net. Final chance. Well, God bless that overseas bidder. <laughs> I think you could do with some divine intervention with the old prophet, Stephen. <laughs> so, you see, my. Conviction was convicted. <laughs> now it's the, dare I say it, panic buy from Natasha. The coopered barrel. 30 is the bid. I've got 30 on the net. It's the 150. <laughs> Any further bidding from the room here? We've got 30. Any advance of 30 pounds for the lot? Take five now. At 35. Oh, wow. <laughs> 35. This is your last chance. <laughs> yep. No one needed a large coopered barrel. So is that your first <laughs> loss? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Natasha's still miles ahead, Stephen. Note to self, no more barrels. Yeah, it's the final lot of the day. Stephen's much-loved needleworked box. And we've lit up at £100, £110. 120 130 That's a lot number. How good is that? How good is that? I've got 130 online. This is your last call. Oh, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. Now, that's more like it, Stephen. Well done. Tell you what. Profit of the day. Needlework box. The king, the king. Long live the king. Well, you know, it's... A... <laughs> Thank you, my faithful subject. Hang on. Before we declare anything, let's work out who the winner is. Stephen spent £177, and after sale room costs, has made a profit of £9.96, giving him £209.96 for next time. But today's chap is Natasha. She dished out 157 and, after all auction costs, has collected a stash of £252.10. Right, OK, shall we go and visit Lavinia? Well, can we afford to fill her up? Yeah, I think we're well, doing all right. Do you know where you left her? Yeah. Okay. See you later, alligator. <laughs>